give our Science Day lecture this time. It, uh, fortunately, it worked out. We, we were, uh, sort of talked to each other about giving a talk, and uh, because Science Day happened, we, we said, why don't you give a public talk? And he very graciously accepted. Uh, Anant uh, did his uh, bachelor's from uh, uh, IIT Madras, and then got his PhD from the University of Delaware, did postdocs in uh, PRL, Lausanne, and uh, Bern, and after that went to ISC, where he's been for, for uh, a little over two decades. He uh, just retired uh, six months ago, was it, as uh, chairman of the, uh, of, of the of, of Czech, the Center for High Energy Physics. And so now he's uh, relatively lighthearted and, and free. He is also, uh, in addition to being a great scientist, he's also a humanist, what in my youth used to be called a secular humanist, I believe. And so I'm happy to have him give a talk today on uh, Science Day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I thought normally this is given after the talk. Now I can just go away with a bouquet and then, you know. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Kathiravan and Jayant for inviting me here. Actually, Jayant is a person I've seen for the last couple of decades, and we have been very good friends on Facebook. And when I discovered from Facebook that he is the director, I said, why don't I come and give a talk? And the reason for this is that I used to come here frequently before the traffic in Bangalore became impossible. And I had a close connection with Banu Das, and after Banu left in 2015, I think I may have come here only once. So my aim was to renew my uh, contact with IIA, and, but I didn't think I would find myself in the spickle of having to give this talk on National Science Day. But that said, uh, now I think I should try and tell you a little bit about um, this talk that I have prepared for you about uh, joys of discovery in modern science. And I have for you a picture of C.V. Raman here, because today is his uh, birth anniversary. And in the country, we celebrate his birthday as National Science Day, as he's the only um, Indian person who did, he, who did his work in India and won the Nobel Prize. And therefore, it's fitting that the National Science Day is named after him. Um, so today, we live in an era where there's so much information on the internet. So why this talk? So I think this talk is mainly to inject a human element into the kinds of things that we do to have a discussion with you all about what this enterprise is all about and why why we do this. It's just a collection of my ideas. It doesn't it's not representative of anything except my own personal choices. I'm sure each one of you enjoys what what you do. If you'd ask me if there's any other title that I could have picked for this talk and why we do science, these are the words that I would have chosen, not my own, but from those of uh, David Hilbert, who was a very great mathematician of the late 19th century and part of the 20th century. So he, he had these words, we must know, we will know. And this is a kind of a, a human urge that we like to get to the bottom of things, especially in science, because it's the only field where we actually can establish laws beyond any reasonable doubt, unlike, let us say, in economics or in social sciences, which are that much harder. So among other things on Facebook, I found a picture of this person who I should have known who she was, but I had no idea about who she was and the importance of the work that she did. So you'll find the answer to this question later in these slides. And when you find the answer, please let me know. So this is a quiz for you all as to who this person is. Um, so let me start out this discussion with a couple of recent discoveries which have captured the uh, public imagination. It's been there on the internet, it's also been on television, and it gets to the heart of the things that we talk about that I would like to talk about in this talk, about the nature of the scientific enterprise and the kind of time scales and the human effort that it takes to actually do science today. This is only an example. I'm sure everybody has their own favorite examples, but since this is a popular one. So um, there was a press conference um, just a little over two years ago and we actually had a live streaming in our institute where we watched this coming from uh, Washington, D.C. And then these were uh, words of uh, David Reiser, who was a spokesman of the LIGO collaboration. And he just made a simple statement. So 
Sorry, I'm giving my talk now, later, bye-bye. That's a hot mic, sorry about that. Um, so, so these are the words that we heard at this press, press conference where he reported the discovery of gravitational waves. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. Now, this is an astonishing thing because gravitational waves were actually predicted by Albert Einstein uh, more than a century ago. And this was data which was first seen by a young postdoctoral researcher of the LIGO collaboration. LIGO stands for the Laser Inter Interferometer Gravitational Observatory. I'll just say a few more words about that. And it's important that it is a very young researcher who actually saw the signal of these gravitational waves. And this confirmed the prediction of the general theory of relativity made about 100 years ago. So then the question that we want to ask is, why did it take 100 years for us to actually you know, validate and vindicate the predictions of the general theory of relativity? And in fact, Einstein himself is supposed to have said that there is no chance that we will ever observe this, because he was not aware of the kinds of <coughs> technological advances that could take place that would make such an observation possible. So this particular event that took place <coughs> was because of gravitational waves that arose in the merger of two binary black hole system. In fact, this observation also confirmed something that many experts believed all along, that there must be binary black hole systems, although there's no definitive proof of that because there's no way of observing them except with gravitational waves. And this was made up of two black holes, each one of which, one of which had a mass of about 36 solar masses, and the other about 29 solar masses. And then they, they merged to form a smaller black hole. As you can see, 36 plus 29 doesn't add up to 62, with the rest of the energy in a fraction of a second being converted into gravitational waves. And this was 1.4 billion years ago. So I often wonder how do you explain a number like 1.4 billion to the common man, the common woman, it's very easy. It's the number of people we have in this country. So that's the number if you want to fix the scale what this is. So in a fraction of a second, such an enormous amount of, of material got converted into energy such a long time ago and traveled in all directions from the site of this merger. And it actually shook the fabric of space time. And that is what is meant by gravitational waves. Is it's like having a bell that you ring and then the waves move out and then it deforms the medium around it. Here the medium is space-time itself and that is what was gravitational waves which were detected. More recently, an even more interesting system has been seen. Uh, this was binary black holes. Actually, the experiment now I think has 10 candidates of such black hole mergers. So it's becoming now uh, you know, a science where they see merger after merger. But more recently, they have also seen neutron star mergers, which has also been seen. I also want to point out that LIGO will also have a station in India. This, I believe, is approved. It will come up in Maharashtra, and this will be called INDIGO, which has some of the letters from, from the Interferometer Gravitational Observatory, and it has part of our country's name, and it will participate in this. So the reason why this happened is because of vast improvements in technology, and then there's also a Nobel Prize for the pioneers of this experiment, Kip Thorne, Rainer Weiss, and Barry Barish. But I must also say that before this experiment in the uh, later part of the 20th century, there was um, a pioneer in these experiments, Jim Weber, who worked very hard and struggled very hard to find gravitational waves, but he did not have the kind of technology that was needed, but he was constantly improving bounds on gravitational wave detection. So one must also remember the work of pioneers like this. So relativity, as you know, was uh, founded by Albert Einstein, it's shown here as a very young man. We all know him only with gray hair and with this, and the pipe, but this is how he looked when he was 26 years old. And within a year of his general theory of relativity, the first black hole solution was given by Carl Schwarzschild, who died soon afterwards in the First World War. And then it had to wait for another 40 years before the next set of solutions for spinning black holes was found by Roy Patrick Kerr. So these black holes are, are the solutions of Einstein field equations. And in fact, the binary black hole merger that you see, actually they are spinning black holes. And then so one sees in the patterns that the LIGO experiment saw the signature of this kind of spinning black holes. So these are two spinning black holes. They merge to form a new spinning black hole. And then there's a whole 
uh, science which tells you how such a merger may have taken place. So this is what is supposed to have happened. There were these two black holes which collided with each other. And in the burst of energy, what you see over here is the ripples that spread outwards everywhere into the cosmos. So, so that is what was seen. So this LIGO-1 experiment data was presented in the following way. So there were two panels like this, that there was a signature of some frequency oscillations that were seen by their lasers as a function of time. Now you may ask yourself, why are there two names over here? One is called Hanford, one is called Livingston. Now we are accustomed to a laboratory being at one place, and once one place on the planet, but this is a very special experiment. It's actually in two different places, and the two different places are separated by thousands of kilometers. One is this Livingston, which is in the state of Louisiana in the US, and the other is in Hanford in, in the state of Washington. So what you see over here is the same signal that was seen by one of them, and it was seen by the other after a few seconds, which meant that this ripples in space-time take some time to go from one part where it first hits the LIGO detector and then hits the second LIGO detector at the other place. I don't know whether it came this way or this way, but there is a delay in the signal that is seen between the two of them, exactly as predicted by Einstein's theory of relativity. I just wanted to show you roughly what this experiment looks like so that you get an idea of the scales involved. So the kinds of lasers that they have are extremely stable lasers in a seismically quiet place that all sources of noises are cut out. Uh, they say that it's a fantastic experiment, but just look at the length scales involved where these lasers are, are uh, allowed to be stable. This is a span of four kilometers over here and four kilometers. So you're talking about remarkable feats of engineering in constructing these experiments. And I guess the Indian one will also have dimensions of this kind. I don't know exactly what their design parameters are. So these are the fine gentlemen who won the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, Rainer Weiss, um, probably in his 90s, and Kip Thorne is a theorist who is the one who had this idea that, look, it is possible to detect this. So it was like a single-minded dedication of Kip Thorne to persuade experimentalists. And it was a discussion between these two people, the theorist and the experimentalist, to use this kind of laser interferometry. Barry Barish actually is a particle physicist by training, but he threw his entire body and soul behind this experiment, and he was also awarded the Nobel Prize. I think it's a rule that all Nobel laureates have to be gray and bald, at least in order to win the Nobel Prize. So I think Grant here is a good candidate. So this. <laughs> yes, yes, Kip Thorne was here. Yeah. So now we have a new kind of astronomy associated with the neutron star merger, not the black hole, but now black holes are black, so they're not going to emit any light. So the only kind of emissions that you'll see from black hole mergers are gravitation, right? But the neutron stars are different because the neutron stars merge. Of course, part of the energy goes into gravitational waves, but it also lights up the sky in a certain way. So there is a new branch of astronomy, which they have called multi-messenger astronomy, where associated with the gravitational wave event, you also see activity in the electromagnetic spectrum. So these neutron star events have set up, created a new era called multi-messenger astronomy, and signals are seen both in the electromagnetic spectrum, various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, bright blue, and so on and so forth. And different experiments across the world were asked to train their instruments to look in that direction because there's also a delay in the electromagnetic spectrum, enough time for these instruments to point in that direction and look for signals. So this actually confirmed a whole lot of other things about the nature um, of production of nuclei, heavier nuclei, which is a big puzzle for a long time, where many of the nuclei that we find on Earth could have come from. There is no evidence that they must have come from neutron star mergers. We know that many heavy nuclei are produced in supernovae. Only up to iron is produced in stellar processes. So neutron star mergers are now a new source of material for the universe for production of all kinds of rare and exotic nuclei. Something that people suspected all along, but in this, only in the last two years, we actually have information that look, indeed, they are coming from this kind of a thing. Then I also saw in the news that someone called Bernard Schutz, he had a very interesting idea that he proposed a couple of decades ago, saying that if you see binary neutron star mergers, they could be used also for measuring the Hubble constant. 
Now, this is very interesting because the Hubble constant is a constant that controls the expansion of the universe. You all know much more than I do about this, but it has always been controversial that there are different kinds of measurements which often don't agree with the errors. And then there are various schools where people keep quarreling with each other that my measurement is right, yours is wrong. So here is a new way of using neutron star mergers also. I also want to emphasize the kinds of different branches of physics that have all come together in this era. So just to remind you of where we are today, well, we are here, the present, and this scale over here is about 13.8 billion years. It all started one fine day in the Planck era and the Big Bang, and then the universe started evolving, various things happened, you know, the universe is a very hot place, and then all the matter in the universe was uh, was a plasma and things were very hot. Then as the universe expanded rapidly, there was probably an inflationary phase when it really became, started expanding in a big way. And then all the matter cooled and eventually started producing hydrogen and helium, the material that most stars are made of, and lithium. These are the elements that are made in the early part of the, um, of the universe's history. Whereas the heavier elements are produced in others, other environments, as I said. So just on the scale, these two binary black holes must have merged somewhere over here. If this is 13 units on the scale, 1.4 units is somewhere here. But also a pretty long time ago. It is not like it was exactly yesterday. So this gives you an idea of the kinds of scales that we come across in, in astrophysics and cosmology. And this pictorially shows the various scales that are involved. So quarks are more or less the smallest particles that you can have. As far as we know, there's no substructure to quarks. The quarks, of course, make protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons together make nuclei. Here is an oxygen nucleus. And then the oxygen nucleus produces silicon dioxide. So this is the hierarchy of scales, how things bigger become bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you download these slides, you can see the kinds of numbers. And then, so, then these silicon mo molecules can make a small grain of sand. Then millions of grains of sand can make a beach over here, and there is the footprint that we leave behind in the sands of time, in the words of the poet. And this sands lie, of course, of the Earth, and then the Earth, of course, goes around the sun, like so. It's a small dot over here. This is Jupiter, which shows you the size of the solar system. And of course, the solar system sits in the Milky Way galaxy. Over there, it's no longer visible. So the number of zeros keeps on increasing as you start from the quark and you end up at the Milky Way. And then the Milky Way, of course, sits in the local supercluster, which sits in the universe. So we are trying to look at physics of all these scales together from the smallest to the biggest. So this is the kind of enterprise that is present in today's world. Now I switch to another sensational discovery, sensational at least to some of us in the field of particle physics. And I want to quote for you the words of the then Director General of CERN already about seven years ago, six and a half years ago. Uh, Dr. Rolf Dieter Heuer, who in his very German way said, very low-key way, these were his words at the major press conference, said, as a layman, I would say, I think we have it. And then he asks the audience, would you agree? So this is how, in his own subtle way, he said that we have made a sensational discovery. And of course, the lecture hall immediately burst into applause. Now, this is the year 2012, and the existence of this particle was predicted by Peter Higgs in the year 1964. So it took 48 years from the time of the theoretical prediction for it to be experimentally seen. One of the points that I'm trying to emphasize here is in science, especially in fundamental science, there are many things which take a long time, requires um, advances in technology, advances in our understanding, how to improve, say, detector technology, and so on and so forth. And this Higgs mechanism was a joint effort of several authors. Uh, Francois Anglais and Robert Braut and Higgs. Uh, Anglais and Higgs were awarded the Nobel Prize for this because Robert Braut had already passed away. And there were other authors also who had similar ideas, but they didn't explicitly talk about the existence of a particle. So it took several generations of dedicated experiments at ever increasing energies to find it. And this too, like LIGO, is even more amazing because of the kinds of things that had to go into the construction of the machine that found it, massive amounts of technology, superconducting magnets, control of beams, so on and so forth. So this is uh, the picture of that press conference. 
this is Peter Higgs and this is from Swanglet and this is Rolf Dieter Heuer. I think this was just before the announcement, announcement was made. So let me give you an idea of the scales again involved in this particular experiment. Uh, experiment often, you know, those of us who went to college think of a potentiometer and you think of, you know, Newton's rings and a small microscope. Here the experiment is a bit bigger. This experiment, the circumference of this ring is about 27 kilometers and it actually goes under two different countries. This is supposed to be a cross section of the Earth uh, between France, I think this is the international border between France and Switzerland. There is a lake of Geneva and it is several hundreds of meters underground so that it is shielded from cosmic radiation and those backgrounds are cut out. And there are many important areas where protons are collided on protons and then the um, results of that collision are studied by these various experiments shown over here. One is called CMS, another is called LHCB, Atlas and Alice. These are the four important experiments where protons are collided on top, on, onto each other at very high energies. And you need rings like this because protons are charged particles and they can be accelerated and brought to very high energies. So the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, as it is called, so this pins down for you the scale of the problem involved. Circumference of 27 kilometers, there's seven detectors. And following with the goals of the LHC, the first one, of course, was the discovery of the Higgs. Is there only one Higgs particle or there are more than one species of Higgs particle? This is still not known. So far, only one has been found. The so-called standard model, which is the electroweak and strong interactions, has to be tested at high precision. And also, one of the goals of the LHC, and I'd like to emphasize it, especially because this is the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, is one of the goals is to search for, for dark matter candidates. Now, all of you know that galaxies must have a halo of dark matter, and we still don't know what this dark matter is. This is one of the big mysteries. Can this dark matter actually be produced in the laboratory? Of course, if it's produced, it's not going to be detected. It's going to escape detection because it's dark. But if you have sufficiently, uh, you know, sophisticated laboratory conditions, you may be able to produce it. And the LHC would obviously be uh, one of the ideal places where these dark matter can actually be produced. We also want to search for other exotic ideas like supersymmetry, whether there are extra dimensions, whether we are actually living in three dimensions and there are other di dimensions. For instance, an ant could be living on a rubber sheet and never be aware that there is a third dimension unless somebody tells it, look, that there is a third dimension. Similarly, maybe we are immersed in more dimensions and we have never seen those dimensions. And then also there are other questions like, does matter and antimatter behave in the same way? And so on, which is also associated with Big Bang and the nucleosynthesis and so on. And this very hot primordial plasma that I talked about that existed at the time of the Big Bang, can we have a laboratory situation where we can create something similar? These are all the goals of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. These are the names of the experiments I'd already mentioned. And I'd like to say that India is also a member of one of these experiments. And in IISC, we have colleagues who are also now members of CERN. There are many other experiments. Since our scientific community is not very large, we are only in one experiment here and also this large ion experiment. Many large countries have members in all these experiments where the scientific personnel is very large. They can afford to be in all these. So what does this detector look like? A detector, as we know, is a microscope. Now, this is a pretty large microscope. There is an average Frenchman or an average Swiss, three of them standing over here. And this is the size of this microscope. It is about 20 times as big as an average Swiss or average Frenchman or French woman. So the principle of producing the Higgs is very simple. We just take two protons and collide them very, very hard at very high energies and hope that in the fireball of this resulting uh, of this uh, collision, a Higgs, bo Higgs boson jumps out. Mathematically, we can predict the rates at which, if it exists, that it should pop out. And then this Higgs boson that pops out is very unstable and it will immediately decay into some other known particles. And then you try to look for those particles. So that's the principle of this experiment. And this is how it would happen. These protons themselves are made up of quarks and gluons. Some of these gluons would collide with each other and produce a Higgs, or some of the quarks inside the protons would collide and produce a Higgs. There are many indirect uh, collisions of the constituents of the protons that could give rise to a Higgs. So mathematically, there is a language called Feynman diagrams which tell you exactly how to produce these particles. And once the Higgs is produced, 
the way you see it is it has to decay into some known particles and the best particles for it to decay into that we could detect are of course photons and here at the institute of astrophysics you spend most of your life looking at photons but these are very energetic photons in the far gamma ray region but of course the cms experiment has the ability to detect such photons so this is what happened that they collided these particles and then they wanted to see whether these uh, two photons could be produced in the final state like so and sure enough as the energy of the particles that we were looking at there is a bump over here associated with the production of a higgs that jumped out of the vacuum in the collision and then decayed into two photons producing a bump in the number of photons that is what is shown over here this is signal divided by signal plus background and then this is as a function of the mass of the diphoton pair that you see over here now all of you know the number 125 125 is 5 cubed but it is also the mass of the higgs when expressed in what we call gv units and you can see that it is peaked at this number 125 it is a giant cross section increase in the cross section where the two photons correspond to the production of yeah so this was the dramatic discovery of the higgs that was celebrated worldwide by physicists and um, so six years later the lhc has conducted many more runs gathered much more data and it has seen so many wonderful things for instance the the lhc doesn't collide only protons and protons it has a mode where it also collides lead on lead pb all of you know what it is we all like calling the plumber because we have to call the plumber 100 times before they come home to fix your tap so lead of course in the old days was a material out of which uh, pipes were made and that is why plumber pb is lead on lead collisions which were seen by the alice collaboration so that is lead is a very heavy element as you know it is the end product of most decays of um, of of uranic and transuranic elements that's the end of all radioactive so it's a very heavy element having an atomic weight of about 210 so you're talking about 210 nucleons being collided against 210 nucleons at very high energies you get very high temperatures you get very high densities and in this incredible collision you can actually liberate the protons and the gluon and the Uh, the, the quarks and the gluons and produce what is called the quark gluon plasma there are many other discoveries besides the higgs such as rare decays of particles that we study which are called b mesons there's new information on matter anti matter symmetry and also the standard model is a phrase that i have used it is incomplete in many ways many people like to extend it and see there are laws of physics beyond the standard model these have also been studied the properties of the higgs have also been studied and so on so this slide is here only for completion for people who might say that i didn't give enough respect to the lhc so this slide is only for those purposes let me also take a break because i'm kind of half way through this talk and tell you a little bit about what i do so i work in this field of elementary particle physics and field theory i am interested in the standard model and its tests at high precision in many different uh, settings for instance uh, there is a particle called a muon which is a heavy cousin of the electron and it has its own intrinsic spin now this intrinsic spin has been measured to very high accuracy at brookhaven national laboratory and is being measured at fermi lab and is very sensitive to activities going on in the vacuum which is described by field theory so i spend my time trying to see how sensitive is the muon anomalous magnetic moment which is its gyromagnetic ratio to these particles i am also interested in mathematical methods that are needed to improve any of these calculations and the technical aspects like um renormalization theory and i also try to ask myself tomorrow if we built other machines what kind of physics would we see at them how do we probe for instance extra dimensions or supersymmetry i also like to say that my own training as an engineer has actually enriched the way in which i approach problems in science at least i think so i don't know if my collaborators do so i just want to say that there are many young people these days whose parents send them to engineering colleges it doesn't mean that it's the end of the world you can always come back and do physics later provided your parents agree of course so now i want to switch to the what i call the human aspect of this enterprise what is it that scientists do what is it that motivates them how do they approach problems 
And what is our role? Now, many of these experiments have thousands of people. LIGO has more than 1,000 people on their papers. The CMS has a couple of thousand. So what is it like to be in an environment like that? How do you contribute and so on? What is it that you can do as an individual? How do you take up problems and approach them and study them? So this is the environment in which we are. And let us think about it and see how we may go forward. And many of you here are very young people. And when you grow old, you will also have to inspire others. You have to guide others. So this is something for you to think about how you approach this, the nature of your work. <clears throat> so the examples that I gave you required massive teamwork and technology for fundamental discoveries. But there are also fantastic discoveries in the laboratory even today, of course, sophisticated laboratories, discoveries such as high critical temperature superconductors. One hears things like graphene, topological insulators, and many of these are actually made in tabletop experiments. But they have all been made possible by advances in technology and also by single-mindedness and perseverance. There is no real escape from this, this kind of hard work, irrespective of what you do in science, because it's a very mature field. And so many hundreds of people, thousands of people, many generations have worked in science. So in order to make any dent today, all of us have to work very hard. There's no choice in that respect. So we can also ask, what is the role of the individual? So let me look into a little bit of history and see what have people, the protagonists who have worked in science, say about why they do science, what are the processes by which they arrived at the discoveries and so on. And what is the key message of all this? Let me see. Down to 25 out of 44, do not panic. Some of them are also pictures. OK. Let me take an example from mathematics, because mathematics is a subject that everybody can kind of relate to, at least those who have had a good education in India. It's the favorite subject. Every parent tells their kids, you have to get centum in. Have you all heard this? Kanakla centum no. So that is the kinds of things that all of us are trained to be good at mathematics. And mathematics has a natural appeal to us. So let us look at one example over here. I also want to draw your attention to certain facts. So one famous example is that of Pierre Fermat. Now, note the year, 1637 who gave his, he didn't call it the last theorem, he, he just wrote some notes, and history has named it Fermat's last theorem. And this is what he said, that look, Pythagoras already knew that x squared plus y squared is z squared, and you can always find whole number solutions for this. We do this all the time, three squared plus four squared is five squared, and it is as old as history because we need it for, you know, buying pieces of land and so on and so forth to go from one point to another. You always needed Pythagoras' theorem. But it was Pierre Fermat, even though this mathematics is thousands of years old, it was only in the last millennium that Fermat actually made a statement. He said, there are no whole number solutions for, let us say, x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed. It is such an easy problem to state that there are no solutions to the equation unless n equals 2. That was 1637. And when was this problem solved? This problem was solved in the year 1994. It took about 360 years for this problem to be solved. And it was settled about 20 years ago by Andrew Wiles. They're both shown over here. This is Pierre Fermat. I don't know, this must be a portrait. And then this is a photograph of Andrew Wiles. So there were many ideas which came in the post-World War era by Japanese mathematicians. And it was finally proved by Andrew Wiles, who lives in the US. Now you see how international this enterprise is. This also something that I want to draw your attention to. And actually, this uh, particular adventure, there are at least two excellent popular science books, one by uh, Simon Singh and one by some other person. My cousin Sitaram has, a, has one in his book collection, um, where they talk about all the steps that it took to prove this. There's also an excellent BBC um, uh, documentary on this, where they talk to Andrew Wiles. It's actually inc incredible that here is a very reserved Englishman who actually breaks down when he's talking about how he made this particular discovery. It's, it's just a beautiful thing. You want to ask something? Yeah. No? Sure? 100%? Okay. Yeah. So then there is another example for mathematics. This is named after Henri Poincaré. And this is, uh, it's called the Poincaré conjecture. So this is a statement about how surfaces, how smooth they are in higher dimensions. Okay, so this is a statement about that. So this 
was uh, formulated by Poincaré at the end of the 19th century, and it was proved in the early part of the 21st century. And I'm also happy to say that this was proved by Grigory Perelman, a Russian, a very strange and eccentric Russian mathematician. But the methods were developed by people from the physics community. People who were working in field theory, actually, who first formulated the early ideas, it was turned into a branch of mathematics by Hamilton. Now, this Perelman, of course, is so strange that he just posted these proofs on the internet and then disappeared from mathematics. He didn't bother submitting his paper to the referee and waiting for the referee's comments. You're missing a comma after equation 63. None of that stuff, okay? So this is how he did his mathematics and just disappeared. And many others checked his proof and found it to be correct. This guy is so eccentric that he also refused the Fields Medal, the highest honor among mathematicians. And even more foolishly, he declined $1 million because that is one of the prizes in this clay mathematics prizes. There are eight such problems. If you solve one of them, well, one is already done. So you have only seven left to solve to get $1 million. Now, all this, in my opinion, actually adds to the romance of mathematics, that indeed, the mathematicians are strange people. I'll say a bit more about that later. So have any of these people talked about how they do this process of creativity, how they learn things, how they approach problems? So Poincaré actually is one of them who is described in some places as one of the last universalists. He worked on all branches of mathematics of his day. So he described his Eureka moment. But of course, Archimedes had his Eureka moment too, but that we can't say for sure. But Poincaré did write about his Eureka moment, and he said that there was one problem that he was working on for weeks or months, could have been years. And one day he was stepping onto a bus and he was waiting for a traffic light, getting onto the bus. And suddenly it flashed on him how to solve that particular problem. This is to say that the human mind is a very strange thing. It doesn't mean that science is a nine to five job, that at 4.59 you will get the problem so that by 5.05 you can send an email to your uh, collaborator. It doesn't work like that. So here is an example of such a thing. Now, all of you know the name Auguste Kekulé, who is the person who figured out the structure of benzene. There's a very famous story. Benzene, as you know, is a cyclic compound, aromatic compound. And people just were very puzzled by its chemical formula and how could such a thing happen. And he says that after thinking about it for a long time, he fell asleep, helped to sleep in seminars. But I think he was asleep at home. And then he had a dream of a snake that was eating its own tail. And that's how he figured out the structure of benzene. <clears throat> so scientists, of course, work very hard for this moment, which or which may not come. Max Planck, who's the greatest revolutionary in science, besides Albert Einstein, says this on his discovery of quantum mechanics, that the outside world is something independent from man, something absolute. And the quest for the laws which apply to this absolute appeared to me as the most sublime scientific pursuit in life. So it's almost as if even scientists think that their enterprise is of a religious or a spiritual nature. And this is not just me talking. This is Max Planck talking. So there is an element of that kind of extreme concentration from which these arise. So other well-known scientists, mathematicians have debated how does one become a professional scientist, professional mathematician who puts things together? How do you approach a problem? Here are a couple of people who have thought about this question. Jacques, Jacques Adama and Hermann von Helmholtz. You all know the Helmholtz equation, the Helmholtz coil, and ophthalmoscope with which the doctor looks into your eye. They're all inventions of Helmholtz. That's one guy. So this is what they said. They said that there are many stages in which you approach a problem and solve it. There is, of course, a period of preparation after which the problem has a incubation in your mind and then you get the idea of what it could be and then you write it down and of course eventually it will also have to be verified. So these are the notions that were put forward by Adamar and uh, Helmholtz. There's an example for instance as you all know in black body radiation there's a puzzle the formula of Vn and Raleigh in two different ends of the electromagnetic spectrum of a heated object so Planck actually put together a formula that he just cooked up that would explain both of them. But it was only later that he actually, two months later, that he had to have a break with all his conventional thinking and find the correct theory that would give this. That was Max Planck talking about how all these stages go into a very great discovery of this kind. 
Now, he's not the only one. Others have also talked about their own engagement with science. This is what Einstein says, and he makes it sound very simple. I was sitting in a chair in the patent office at Bern. Actually, most of the pictures of Einstein in the patent office are him standing, because I think they're not allowed to sit down. But anyway, so he says that he was sitting in a chair in the patent office at Bern. All of a sudden, a thought occurred to me. If a person falls freely, you'll not feel his own weight. I was startled. This simple thought made a very deep impression on me. It impelled me towards the theory of gravitation. So this was the kind of equivalence principle <coughs> and the equivalence of acceleration of gravity Einstein talks about. Our own fellow countrymen had the following to say about his work. In some strange way, any new fact or insight that I may have found has not seemed to me as a discovery of mine, but rather something that had always been there and that I had a chance to pick up what Chandrasekhar said. I wanted to show you a picture of this incredible collection of scientists. I think this was about 1920 or so, the Solvay Conference, where some of the greatest pioneers of science were present. So here is Lorenz over here, here is Einstein, and uh, I would like you to pick up the one odd person in this collection. Anybody strange that you can see over here? Unusual? Huh? I'll give you a hint. 50% of mankind. Huh? Tell me. Ah, the lady. Yes, yes. 50% of mankind. No, not yet. Yeah. This is Marie Curie. You would know who it is. So it won't be such an easy answer. I think somebody has to give him a chocolate eclair when he finds the right one. So you see here how exclusive this club was. There's only one woman in this collection of about 50 people. It's rather different now. Just look around you in this audience. That's a good thing. Let me tell you about many of the examples that I talked about were from a long time ago problems. Now here is another incredible discovery in a changing world, and this is what I want to emphasize. There's something mathematics calls the twin prime conjecture, which says that there's an infinite number of primes that differ by two. Very easy to state. Even these little children sitting in this front row, that guy's looking at a smartphone. Yeah, even you would understand what is the twin prime conjecture. There are infinite number of, no you, infinite number of primes that differ by just two. Okay, it's very easy to state. Can you prove it? It's not easy to prove. In fact, there was no progress in this problem for the longest time till about three or four years ago, where this person, Yitang Zhang, who was working as college lecturer in the US, not at some top place, not at Harvard, not at Princeton, but in the University of New Hampshire, he was a lecturer. He found a proof that you can always have two proofs, or two primes that do not differ by more than some large upper bound. And the number he found was 70 million. It doesn't matter how large it was, it was still finite. So that was the proof, the first breakthrough in this incredibly important problem, which came hundreds of years after it was first stated. So this came out of the blue, working in isolation. And then there's this other guy, James Maynard, who proved the similar results coming using different methods. But what this led to by Terence Tao, who was one of the most influential mathematicians here, he immediately jumped onto the internet and posed a bunch of problems and invite, invited the entire mathematical communi community to participate in improving this upper bound of Yitang Zhang. So this is an incredible you know, joint effort of all these people using the internet. So in the modern world, you see how people scattered all over the world can come together and try to solve problems together. To me, this is an astonishing thing. I have to quote, I did say that mathematicians are strange, and so are astronomers and astrophysicists. And I quote from our own fellow astrophysicist, my colleague down the uh, corridor, Arnav Raichaudhary, who had this to say. It's a little heavy, but let me read it out about what we actually do. We cannot share our intellectual excitements even with our spouses or closest friends. We are perpetually estranged from our fellow human beings. It's sad. A good scientist, of course, has personal moments of intellectual triumph, but is forever denied those thrills which a triumphant musician standing in front of the stage feels when the whole audience bursts into applause. In popular stories, scientists are very often depicted as awkward individuals, unsuited to everyday life. Do I look like an awkward individual? Anyway, people who boil clocks for breakfast and keep on doing calculations on sand, that is again Archimedes, even when their lives are in immediate danger. If all scientists are really like this, then they would probably have been eliminated from our society by the processes of natural selection. <laughs> However, I believe that these popular stories tell us one truth, the fact that science is a very strange enterprise, although scientists themselves may not necessarily be strange people. 
Now, this was written by Arnab in 1985. That was 34 years ago, and he was a young man of 25. This is to say that even young people like you all should think about what is the nature of this enterprise and be engaged in this debate, which is not. There are also other discoveries and other fields that I have not covered. All monumental contributions, theory of evolution, Mendel's theory of genetics. These are all stupendous uh, feats. Continental drift as a hypothesis. The person who first came up with this idea, everybody thought he's a crackpot, but we know that it's true. There are others who said that, look, there have been ice ages in the past. People didn't believe them. And who would have thought that the same processes that are responsible for wine are also responsible for diseases? That's the Pasteur's theory of microbes. You see how unifying it is. Then there is Shannon's information theory, without which, you know, our smartphones wouldn't work. So here is a bunch of topics that I have not covered. This is what Charles Darwin says on his own theory. There is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. You see, here is a person who worked on this subject for I don't know how many decades, and he gives this incredible summary of his own discoveries. I think that is an amazing thing. Now to the missing 50%. There are tremendous achievements by women, needless to say, but not many are aware of them. So let us see, let us catalog a few of them, not all. For instance, the founder of computer science, modern computer science, is often attributed to Ada Lovelace, who was, I guess, uh, somehow related to Byron the poet. Daughter. Hmm? Daughter. Daughter, oh, okay, daughter, yes. Okay, uh, that's what, they, um, then there's Emmy Neuther, who was a founder of modern algebra. She, her work is also of great importance to, to particle physics. Marie Curie, you already found. Who wants Eclair? Who wants Eclair? Now you have to say out of this list who's there. Now, Cecilia Payne and the stuff that the universe is made of, okay? That she's the one whose picture I showed. And I had never heard of her until a few weeks ago, except for Facebook. And her work is being featured over there as this missing person. She broke the glass ceiling at Harvard, the first woman to have been tenured in the astronomy department. She's the one who figured out the abundances, in various stellar and interstellar media of the relative abundances of hydrogen and helium. It is that crucial. In mathematics, there's Julia Robinson, who solved one of Hilbert's problems, uh, one of the defining problems of mathematics of the 20th century. We all know dark matter that we mentioned was also discovered by a woman, Vera Rubin. And you all have seen Jocelyn ben Bell, undoubtedly. She must have visited the Institute of Astrophysics. She recently was awarded this fundamental prize and gave away all the money. She said, I don't need this money and set up fellowships with that million dollars. We also know that the path to the double helix rested on the work of Rosalind Franklin. She was not uh, very much knowledge for her contributions during her very short lifetime. For the first time, the Fields Medal went to a woman uh, five years ago, Miriam Mirza Khani. And today, the director of CERN is no longer Rolf Dieter Hoyer, but it's a woman, Fabiola Giannotti. So this is to say that even though historically women have been excluded for a long time, it's really now time to make up for all that last time. Okay? So this is what these women look like. This is Emmy Neuther. This is before the Eastman Kodak, I suppose. That is Miriam Mirza Khani, unfortunately passed away last year. Very young age, just early 40s. And that is Fabiola Giannotti. What can we say about science in our own country? Everything that I've been talking about, essentially, has been another time, another place. How about here? Well, of course, we all know about the work of Ramanujan. His work, more than 100 years after, nearly 100 years after his death, even today, continues to shape the direction of modern mathematics. Many people spend their whole careers working on his ideas. Of course, we are here to celebrate Raman's birthday. We don't have to say that. In astrophysics, you have Saha and his ionization equation. You have Bose and his discovery of Bose statistics. And Baba and his scientific interest. You know all this, but I'm going to make a certain point at the end of all this. Uh, Raichaudhuri and his equation of um, cosmology is well known. Ramachandran in the triple helix, not so well known that his work was that important. And there was Bibal Sani who worked on 
paleobotany. Then there was E.K. Janaki Amal, who pioneered the study of cytogenetics. There are actually very few source books on the work of these very important people. In fact, in my opinion, the only really comprehensive set of references on this are these slim books by Venkatraman, which he has written for college students. The whole um, tradition of writing detailed scientific biographies in India is more or less absent. As far as Raman is concerned, there are a couple of authoritative books, but for most of these, there's nothing. For a long time, if you wanted to see anything about Saha, the only thing you could read was his citation for his election to the Royal Academy. This was the only information that was known about the life of Saha. So this is another area in which a lot of work needs to be done by Indian people about, about our own scientists, what kind of work they do, and the importance of this work. Even Baba, I believe, for the first time now, there is a serious scientific biography by some people in TIFR. I think it just come out a year or two ago. Well, that said, that was all people of a long era in the past. What is it like in India into the present? I would say that it has actually completely changed since 1947 because science is now really a profession. I mean, we are all essentially engaged in the profession of science. It's not a hobby. It is not something that, you know, we just do for the heck of it. It really is truly a profession. And we do meet international standards. And there are a lot of opportunities for the present generation. Not all of which are obvious, not all of which are apparent, but there are opportunities. The thing is that what is missing, in my opinion, could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope people will discuss this, is that there is practically no discourse on the process of creativity and discovery in India. We really know very little about each other, what we do, why we do, as far as I know. So it would be good to explore this in detail. There are only a couple of people I know who have actually talked about their own Eureka moments, how did they come across their discoveries. About 15 years ago, there was a very important result from IIT uh, Kanpur by Manindra Agarwal and two of his students, where they, it's a problem in computer science about the polynomial growth of, of uh, polynomial time that is required for testing whether a number is, is, pri is, is a prime or not. And then they discuss in fair amount of detail how they did the work and the kinds of formulas that they checked. My very senior colleague, uh, Professor Anil Kumar, who is an expert on uh, NMR. In fact, he's called Anil NMR by many because there are several Anil Kumars in the Institute. So he has a detailed article on how he made some of his most important discoveries, something called the nuclear overhauser effect in biological molecules. He has a very interesting story on the kinds of things he had to do, how it was a Christmas period when the labs were all closed where he was working. And he had to wait for somebody to open the door, and then he had to go and test his ideas. It's a fascinating story. It would be very good if everybody maintained a diary or a weblog or Facebook posts on the kinds of things that they do, and we all educate each other on how we go about this. Uh, he was a postdoc in, uh, he was a young person postdoc. Yes, yes, that's true. But he is really an Indian scientist trained here. He just happened to be there and he was using those instruments at that particular time. PhD from IIT Kanpur and his whole career has been spent in IISC. But he also had a couple of postdoc tenures at ETH Zurich. Here is an example of science in the 21st century. Does everybody know who this person is? This is Venki Ramakrishnan who has just recently even written a book and released it at the Jaipur Literary Festival. How about that? Yeah. So anyway, so I believe, now I have not read this book where he discusses how he made the discoveries that he did, but he also made other very interesting observations that I want to record for you. He says this, it takes courage to tackle very hard problems in science. Okay, so not a picnic. But he says he does not want science to be converted into a contest. It's also very different. You don't have to get 100% in mathematics. You have to be true to the subject. It's not a contest to please your parents or do better than your neighbor, uh, but it is something that requires a lot of commitment. And what his father, who was also a professor of biochemistry, in an interesting interview, said that in his opinion, his son was very successful because he had really multidisciplinary training and he could take ideas from many fields and, of course, emphasizes the importance of hard work. And then there is a, a saying attributed to Seneca the Younger. It says that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So this, I think, is an important thing for all of us to keep in mind. 
not so much Jayant and me who are at the end of our careers, but for the younger people, of course. Why basic science? So you may say we are a poor country or this or that, but basic science has a role in all societies. So here is Robert Wilson, who is the founder of Hermilab in the US, who made this statement only from a long range point of view of a developing technology. We, when he was asked what good is particle physics is what he said. Otherwise it has to do with, are we good painters, good sculptors, great poets? I mean all the things that we really venerate and honor in our country and are patriotic about. In that sense, this knowledge has all to do with honor and country, but it has nothing to do directly with defending our country, except to make it worth defending. These are fabulous words. Of course, here you replace his country by our country. That without all this, all we will have is malls and shopping centers and so on. But we need also to have science, we need to have technology, we need to have independence. Victor Weisskopf on basic science, he was the first director general of CERN. The value of fundamental research does not lie only in the ideas it produces. If science is highly regarded in the importance of being concerned with the most up-to-date problems of fundamental research is recognized, then a spiritual climate is created which influence all other activities. I think they are all atheists, but they still talk about spiritual climate. An atmosphere of creativity is established which penetrates to every cultural frontier. Applied sciences and technology are forced to adjust themselves to the highest intellectual standards which are determined in pure research. That is what attracts productive people and brings productive scientists to those countries where science is at its highest level. Now, this is a statement from a very long time ago, but it's still true. Okay? So this is something that somebody asks you, why are you doing astrophysics, what is all good for? Then you direct them to slide number 42 of my talk. Okay? So this is my advice for young people, because today is the National Science Day, so I'll give you advice. I think you should follow your hearts. Nothing is more fun than research and discovery. You should throw open the doors to a new tomorrow. Without science and research, there is no tomorrow. But of course, be forewarned, requires a lot of patience. It's like running a marathon, or it's more like sprinting a marathon at times. And when we off, um, reply to referee reports, that's how we feel. Uh, Thomas Alva Edison, as you know, defined genius as 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. I also direct you to a very wonderful article which you can find on the internet by Richard Hamming, where he talks about you and your research. If you read this, you will be able to rejig your own the way you do research. Okay? It really helps because the very experienced person who's talking about how to do research. And finally, some more words of Chandrasekhar. The pursuit of science has often been compared to the scaling of mountains, high and not so high. But who amongst us can hope, even in imagination, to scale the Everest and reach its summit when the sky is blue and the air is still, and in the stillness of the air, survey the entire Himalayan range in the dazzling white of the snow stretching to infinity? None of us can hope for a comparable vision of nature and of the universe around us. But there is nothing mean or lowly in standing in the valley below and awaiting the sun to rise over the contingent of So that is Chandrasekhar. Okay? So this is kind of sobering part of it. Um, I made the mistake of giving versions of this talk to two colleagues, Daniel Wheeler and Brajesh Chaudhary from Delhi University. And they made so many suggestions that it took me one week to get this talk into this shape. So let me once again take you back to Hilbert as I prepare to finish this talk. This time I show you the, um, the epitaph of David Hilbert. And he still says, we must know, we will know. But in German, where müssen wissen, where did wissen? This is the reason why we all do science. Thank you. This is, of course, a, a hard question to answer. Um, you see, I think uh, any society has its own level of technological advancement. Many of the great 
discoveries in science also rest on the level of the science where you are doing that particular work. If you are at Bell Labs, it is quite different from being at a lab which doesn't have adequate facilities. It is true that also there has been a lot of flight of talent from India. It is a natural process. In fact, the term brain drain was not invented in India. It was invented in Britain in the 60s and the best biochemists and the best physicists went to the US. So that is a fact that, that it is like that. Uh, why we say? I think it is the lack of numbers. See, when you're looking at really great discoveries, you're not looking at the average, but you're looking at the fluctuation which goes a square root of n. So when n itself, the number of people involved. In India, the number of people involved is relatively small. So the square root of n is significantly smaller. While if you take a country like the US, hundreds of universities, hundreds of labs, and we only hear about the peaks. For every one of those peaks, there are hundreds who are just doing good work, average work. Probably that is the reason. Um, They have a lead of several centuries, uh, not so much the US, but definitely Europe. Yeah, yeah. So the European tradition went there and then uh, especially after the war, they, they got so much excellent talent from, you know, countries that were devastated by the war, not necessarily the countries that lost, but even other countries and the US in particular and Australia, New Zealand, they are all open societies. They create a situation where the best talent from all over the world is willing to go there. My late, my departed friend Fidel Castro has a fantastic article published in Voltaire.org where he talks about this issue of brain drain, where he asks the US, you have rigged the economic system of the world in such a way that you take the best people from all our countries and then you point fingers at us and say, see how backward you are. It is not as serious for India as it is for many Latin American countries, but there is an element of that. The other reason is that uh, for every dollar you can buy 75 rupees and human beings are attracted by those things and very good people do go there. But this is to say that, but we are not to lose heart. We do the best that we can under our circumstances. That's my, I don't know if I satisfied you in any way. Uh, quite too far. I mean, there's absolutely no denying the fact that everyone is a Absolutely no denying. Yeah. They are intelligent, so they are working. And the country is throwing money at right? At a small number. You see, the, the numbers of universities that we have in India are nominally very high, but it's only the smallest fraction of them where anything at all goes on. There may be some routine teaching or teaching going on, but in these hundreds of universities, there's no research worth mentioning. Even in IITs, people have a lot of difficulty doing research because they have heavy teaching obligations, committee work, so on. There are numerous factors of this kind on which I'm not an expert. Of course, I've thought about it because I'm a member of the same uh, you know, society. But this is my, my honest opinion. And science is also not easy. So that's how it is. I don't know if anybody else has it yet. Yeah. Yes, just, just later to have a question. So David, just one word. He was in Guatemala. And before the Second World War, around that time, the number of Nobel laureates that came from working in the university was higher. But after the 70s, there were hardly any. So, a much more complex. I mean, we, we in India actually, this may uh, not be the most opportune moment to say it, but I'll say it anyway. We in India have never really had a modern war. The last war that was fought on Indian soil. In 1857, and none of us remembers it. We've had border wars with our western neighbor and our northern neighbor. Nobody here really knows what it means to have a war where you have whole towns leveled, whole generations wiped out, all the intelligence are fleeing, and so on. And those effects last decades. Okay, so let me use this occasion to spread my peace message also. What, what do you, you, you saw something in the hospital, there's a bit about um, the, the increasing cost of, of high energy physics, because astronomy also, the James Webb is about $10 billion. Yes. Where is the joy of physics yeah. if you have to spend $10 billion? Well, I'm very glad you asked this question, because repeatedly in this talk, I have tried to emphasize that 
discoveries in science are not necessarily related to the lifespan of a human being. Even Einstein has already been gone 60 years, couldn't have dreamed that his... So, you know, or, or even uh, people are in, a, are in a real hurry. 2008, the LHC has turned on, and then you want to have a plethora of uh, discoveries in the next 10 years. Well, we found the Higgs. It's a good beginning. We don't know how long these things will take. Uh, I mean, Fermat's last theorem, you can explain it to a second standard kid. It took 360 years to settle that. So, you know, it's, it's a waiting game and we have to do science in order to know what is there. The problem with media and so on is they want to know what you're going to find when you do the experiment. That is a little hard, I think. So, anyway, that's my opinion. So. Yes. Yes, yes, it's it's the it's, it's the lead it's it's ionized lead. They strip all the electrons out, and it carries a charge or whatever it is, uh, eighty electronic units, eighty eighty eight. God knows what it is. Yeah, so it is accelerated. Yes, yes. No, 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 not the collider. Only that interaction region. The environment of the collider is ultra cold. Actually, it is only when the collisions take place that in that collision region that you produce a state of matter that is extremely dense, extremely hot. Okay. Yes, but they are charged particles. The, the lead nuclei are charged particles. So it's cyclotron principle here. You know, they gather data over several weeks and months of running. So it is a very complicated analysis. It is not like you say that you have seen a Higgs like that. So this is all detailed hypothesis testing. So they have a lot of data which is available and what they call grid computing. They invented something called grid computing to store the enormous amounts of data that are reached. Then this data is analyzed and the background subtracted and so on. It has been subsequently, they keep on finding the statistics keep improving, statistics keep improving. And then the two different experiments, ATLAS and CMS, which had some minor mismatches in the determinations of the masses, they all come together. And there is, a, so there are two experiments and they are blind. They were not allowed to discuss their own experiments. It was only very, very senior higher ups who had the privilege of seeing the data of both experiments. So it's like a, like a, like a war. And these guys are like generals, but anyway. Yeah. In my opinion, it's, it's it's healthy. There are many groups across the country, all the way from you know my own institute to there is ICTS in Bangalore, there's Tata Institute several DA institutes, several good universities. There are a lot of young, talented people who continue to work. Um, and in my opinion, from their publication records and all, they are doing very well. How impactful it is, it's hard to say, because many frontier areas are also speculative, right? So it's only time that will say, which will, which will tell whether the work was OK or not. Actually, I have so many questions. I could answer an interview sometime later. <laughs> I asked. Welcome. Yes. Yeah. Sir, what is the thing, sir, history of hobby scientists, people who are in other professions, but yeah. ended up in science and discovered something great? Okay. Um, so, how do they build a culture in which these people, small school children and all, enjoy science? Yeah. And then maybe they go into other fields. But the knowledge in other fields can combine to make us a more better scientific part instead of being professional scientists. Yeah. Like you could have professional, non professional politicians also. Yeah. Policies. yeah. That so, this is a very important question. Uh, Lawrence, um, he was a school teacher. The Balmer formula that you know for, for spectra, he was also a school teacher. So, there was an era in Europe when they were not as such professional scientists but people who did science on the side out of the passion for the subject. They also had the training or they were also brilliant people. So, so they did it. So science as a profession is actually a rather recent invention. Earlier, at least in Europe, they, people used to work in university departments. Often they were theology departments. So science is, is a kind of a newcomer. Mathematics and science, they started to flourish 18th, 19th century. 
but there are others who are also you know like hobbyists i think a uh, person who found the calorific theory of heat and all he used to do experiments with the side and uh, there were there were people like that today there is a situation where there is something called citizen science for instance comet hunting is a very famous example of citizen science where a large number of people are given small telescopes to go and look for it or there are other citizen science projects in uh, germany and switzerland and all where people are given massive amounts of data and asked to look for exoplanets they are also asked to look for whether there are correlations among galaxies and so on there are others who are given strawberry plants and asked them to measure every day how much the plant has grown thousands and thousands of strawberry plants so that you collect data on levels of pollution and growth and so on so the citizen science citizen science can exist in many different ways this is for everybody to think and find solutions of this kind very young children i think they need to have good books they need to have people who can explain some things to them there is of course the internet which has really transformed the world now uh, information is literally on everybody's fingertips tips no problem is a human thing that is needed to explain things properly what is the grand solution to all this i don't know but we can first start off by saying we don't have to do puja every day we don't look at rahu ketu and all that stuff already a good beginning you know to say no to superstition to to bogus ideas that have come down with us and then we are a modern society so we will we will evolve when we will grow have i satisfied you he wants he'll have asked for two interviews now so. yes I think we need both. I really do. Honestly, do believe we need more. We also have to have uh, some way in which young people are assured of a future. You know, the problem is today this whole track of doing a BSc, MSc, PhD, and a postdoc, and then another postdoc, and yet another postdoc. It does bother people that you may be 35 or 40 by the time you settle. It's really a problem. in the soviet union they used to have a situation where a person was a brilliant student by 19 or 20 they are essentially a member of the lab you may get a phd you may not get a phd of course people will immediately say oh that is socialism it's very bad and so on there is a solution somewhere in between i think the issue of livelihood is very important especially people who come from middle class lower middle class families earning money to support older people and their families is an extremely important question and it is uh, what can i do i am a professor that nobody listens to these are all questions that uh, ministers and other policy makers have to take up i am sure they are aware of it but we are in a situation where the government only wants to cut spending all the time they want everybody everything to be outsourced to industry private sector and so on maybe we should ask adani and ambani to start producing fellowships these issues are there i am not saying it is a joke because in the us and all big capitalist support science you know simons foundation has so many fellowships these info this um, zuckerberg and all these guys they are the ones who give this foundation prize they are in a big way participating in their own logic they are working on the development of their society we should ask here narayan murthy has set up one or two small things but we should ask azim prem ji we should also ask our uh, priyanka chopra all these people also to use some of their ill gotten gain and support society you know i really and honestly mean it amir khan was busy playing chess once which is a good thing he should also work on farmar's last theorem and inspire children to work on that sorry <clears throat> yeah they should participate they don't so this is one number to that yeah. you know which uh, i would say that that point that represents is actually a sense of about for the government to, to pay yeah and and that the us the remainder of the money comes from private yes companies and i looked it up and it's actually true yeah the us gets about 0.7% to from government funding yeah the remainder of the 2.5% or so comes from private yes what do you mean my last question no no i'm in no hurry unless you are yeah. <laughs> hey the sky the sky watch yeah <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So after independence, what changed that our uh, entrepreneurs or these these rich guys they are not 
this is something only they can answer they don't seem to so think it's to important say, is it that uh, we are going to be more materialistic and things that uh, that was at that time that has changed you know you know we, we need to be a powerful one and then because as such that usa is doing usa is a powerful you know how rich people you know how rich people get rich they save every penny that's how they get rich in the first place now someone like tata was very exceptional he was uh, you know had a different vision and then he did what he did today we are not able to get ambani is richer than tata but uh, you know he has he only sets up engineering colleges so that can have more engineers to work in reliance and so on somebody should go and tell him that look buddy i mean you know you are spending all this money on your daughter's wedding why don't you you know give some money to i a you know i'm not joking somebody has to tell these people so, that so my question was that is it like a really organic thing that once we become at a level of a uh, richness only then we can the private individuals can get all uh, sign kind of or every all but why the these are billionaires they are not millionaires billion remember the number number of people in this country they are all billionaires why they are not spending i don't know Some, they should have a little bit of sense of shame and they should contribute with some yeah there are a number of people actually are very yes we are totally generally supporting thank you yes i agree but the thing is perhaps no no we are also teaching we are also no, contributing to the society No, no. I even even pure research is so difficult to do. Internationally competitive research sitting in a developing country is no mean feat. To get one paper past that referee of whatever it is, astrophysical journal, is no mean feat. So our work doesn't show up as a direct benefit in terms of 16 children having graduated, but it contributes to, as Bob Wilson said, making this country worth defending. so i don't think that it is money that is ill spent or anything like of course we can always improve why would anybody deny that yes yes those guys i i don't know they are rich there is no mechanism yes 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 oh 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 i see i i'm getting your point yeah okay okay yeah thanks yeah Told, One second. If the children want to go, they are welcome. Whoever wants to stay is also welcome. Yeah, yeah. All the Sky Watch kids. Yeah. Yeah. Much. Of course, the driver may go away. That's also a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Only some are leaving. There are others who want to stay and discuss. Yeah. America stole a march of centuries from Europe. Yeah. There are always a handful of people who come and work in India, but you know there is again a factor which is uh, these so-called frontier societies are societies which don't have baggage and history. They have seen in the sense they wiped out whoever was there and started afresh. So everybody is the same. Everybody is an immigrant. Ours is a very old-fashioned Orthodox society. It's very difficult for foreigners to come and live here, and there's the foreigners from Nepal, which is economically even worse off than us. Okay, okay. yeah, thanks, Queen. Yeah. So, um, so, so that is my take on this: that uh, it is not easy for others to come and live here. There are some people who do. They may have personal reasons. They may have a spouse, or they may have be attracted to Indian culture. But those would be the exceptions. no but those are people who only come for a few years they will not settle down here of course there are uh, you know michelin tires and all have factories in bangalore bosch right here but these people come for a few years and then they go away whether they'll come and work in our institutes and teach and so on it will be hard for them but of course they can apply and so on Uh, so, 
who can afford to take two, three years of research and experiment with such lifestyle? Then who will take you back? If you're just finished your PhD and you say you want to do some, then three years later you're applying for a job, people are going to look at your CV and who's writing your letters of recommendation. See, it is a hard competitive profession. I can't deny that. In programming, there is a, a company called Hacker Rank based out of Bangalore. Started by some graduates from NITCP. What yeah. they do is that they hold programming contests online through which a lot of recruitment happens. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yes, we had such a thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was in the industry called the industry project, not just for academia. So, programmers are able to justify their existence, means without college degrees. Yeah. Science and fundamental science is more opportune for that. Means some of Systems can be developed so that you don't need a long degree. If you're a vice chancellor of a university and somebody applies to you without a PhD and with, with all these alternative skills, will you be able to appoint such a person? It's, it's very difficult. Of course, we have to evolve, we have to change, we have to be more flexible and so on. But uh, it's not in the hands of individuals, it's in the hands of policymakers and others. And at the core of all this, there is the issue of livelihood which will not go away. You know? So. How many of us yeah, can afford to take chances? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering if uh, you guys are taking the problems to provide high And whereas countries like India are getting a large private support and more support they want. Is this really necessary to see about the artists from India or from others? I personally don't subscribe to that. I almost never use phrases like Indian science, Indian physics, Indian mathematics. I don't. There are some who do, but who am I to tell them? So it is true that it is science of science. Uh, it just so happened in a certain phase of history, a lot was done in Germany. The present era, probably a lot is done in the US. So science of science. No, but it is an issue, right? I mean, if if I'm trained by the Indian taxpayer and then I was off just in search of a better life, it is not a crime to do it, but it is a loss for the country. There is no doubt about it. Because I, if I'm going to be a teacher and I inspire a hundred others, it is an investment into the future. Each one of us is an investment into the future, right? So. I can only refer to you to this article by Castro. And you can read over there. You don't have to take everything he says literally or verbal or verbatim, but something to think about. Uh, everybody argues that, oh, you know, there are returns in terms of foreign exchange from other countries. And that. But it is a fact that India and other developing countries have suffered from the fact that there has been so much flight of talent. And also, I didn't want to quite say that there aren't enough uh, adequate facilities in the country or adequate funding, which is basically Piroza's point, that there is more than adequate funding, but there could be more. It, actually, today what we have is a problem of finding enough people to come into science. So in my opinion, uh, so the existing resources can support them. Perhaps the numbers are not enough. Perhaps we have to think more. And the thing is, uh, everybody wants to set up engineering colleges and dental colleges and so on. We have to also educate important people about the importance of these things that will not show up in your quarterly report of profits but it's a long-term investment that's the idea of all this corporate social responsibility and so on so it's not like i'm the only one to be talking about it how effective these are and so on only time will tell like my dad never knew this kind of feeling. Yeah. It took me like long time to make you understand what I'm doing. Yeah. How do you make common people care about what? Then only like politicians will actually put money into it. So why would they care? See, first of all, uh, what we do is difficult. It's very easy to have uh, a puja and uh, you know the subscribe channel and so on and so forth because people can relate to it at an emotional level. Our enterprise also calls for the exercise of the brain, not just the heart. Right. So and people have to be willing to think and use their brains. Everybody has to work a little bit Can't just go and offer things to people on a platter. Let them make an effort. And today with the Internet and all there's so much information. People are willing to read garbage for hours together on the Internet. Why don't they read good stuff? You know, 
I know that people today are much better educated about about medicine than they were 20 years ago or 10 years ago because of the internet. You have a, a pain in the arm, you'll immediately go and start Googling and then start reading, you know, find out lymphocyte count, all these things. It's not as if people are not willing to engage with science. They are. And I think the internet is making a difference. Well, we have to go out. I have written dozens of articles in Current Science and Resonance, which nobody has read, of course. So these are all the ways in which each one of us can contribute. You maintain a blog where you write about the most exciting stuff about LIGO and this and that. And then in the long term, there has to be an effect. There is no doubt about that. In in which direction? Too many PhDs. Yes, but then so many PhDs are outright junk. We can say that for a fact, you know, that we know that in India is a country where you can go and buy a degree and have a PhD written on it in any alphabet you want, you know, no problem. Issue of quality control is also there. The question is whether a truly deserving person who has worked very hard for dues is going to get. I know that it is a very non-linear and unpredictable process, but it has been the same for everybody. You know, even for me, getting a job in IIC, okay, I had all the right degrees, but it took several iterative processes before I could find a job. There is no without a struggle, nobody gets anything. When you go to US and slog it out in Silicon Valley, you may start out at some very low level. Everybody thinks Silicon Valley is. Uh, Nadella and uh, Pichai. It's not like that. No, there are hundreds and thousands of people who do very ordinary jobs. Now, that's that's the way it is. Well, that's the problem. That's the problem with the government, which wants to cut down everything. Now, the whole economic climate is to cut down spending. Now, who am I to say this is a democracy? We have elected a government which has certain policies. If they cut it down, then. After some years, there may be some correction, course correction. Yeah, yeah there was just one, one second. Is somebody there? Yeah. 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 Culture is a part of science. Well, it's true, of course. If you look at this famous book, uh, Wonder That Was India by A. L. Basham. He has long appendices on India's contributions to science, to, you know, measures and weights and, uh, you know, star charts and everything. But ours is a very old society. It is also ossified. It has gone through long periods of stagnation. Not as if science is alien to India or anything. The kind of modern science that we have today is something that came from outside. It is not like our mind is incapable or anything. The thing is, we have had hundreds of years where large sections of the population never got any education. And these problems won't go away overnight. But still, it is better than what it was 50 years ago, if you look at all the charts. It could have been much better, but we can't go back into the past. Correct. Satisfied? Well, at least something to think about. Yeah. You see, uh, Indian in Institute of Astrophysics, TIFR, IIC, numerically we are actually very small. You know, our institute is there in the newspaper every day. Number of faculty members is only 400. Only 400. So even if I take your recipe, how many jobs does it create annually? Very little. The thing is, there are so many universities where nobody has been appointed for 20 years. There are numerous colleges, even a city in Bangalore, where, you know, people are working, actually work very long hours. We can have a more human, humane system. It doesn't mean that every PhD necessarily is going to get a research position. They can make excellent teachers also. So.
recommendation was given. Let's face it. There is a, another problem with this, which is that if you got rid of the letters of recommendation, you would have so much inbreeding. Many university departments have. Well, uh, all I can say is that there are many university departments, especially where there are fiefdoms. There's some guy who became a professor at the age of 35 and keeps on appointing his own students and so on. So the letter of recommendation may actually have a corrective effect that somebody from outside can come. Yeah. All true. I have uh, I have stopped trying to find solutions to problems. Uh, my aim in this was to was to encourage younger people to get into the game. Yeah. Everybody has to fight peer pressure. Peer, peer pressure is a, is a given, just like traffic in Bangalore is a given. There's nothing you can do to change it. Now, every person has to exercise his or her own judgment and decide what to do with their life. And there's not too much advice that you can give because if things go wrong, she will hold you as well. I'm giving you advice, not her advice. So let her make her own decision. You know, it's not going to be a catastrophe either way. Something happens, Big Brother is always there to take care of it. Tell her, you know, to be romantic at least at a young age. Every situation will have, ought to have some course correction. This is the present mode is like this. Two years from now, things may change, you know. Uh, that is all I can say. Yes, this is true. Even in my own institute, there's constant talk about uh, patents and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe some, they want you to do instrumentation or build a better, better telescope or better measurement of this or that. Yes, that pressure is there. It's there on everybody. Um, all this business of uh, patents and intellectual property. This is also a given thing. There is a, a mood and a climate in the country where you are supposed to be economically useful. Now, policy makers do not necessarily understand the value of academic freedom or what we actually call blue sky research, the research for the sake of research. It may have some spin off, but we can't say for sure. It's the same thing. It's like asking if I build this accelerator, what is it going to find? You can't tell. So there is a place for fundamental research and no, you cannot have a country of this size and of its uh, history and civilization. You say you are not going to do basic science. It makes no sense. 
and there will be no future there are other countries where the the let's say human uh, development index may be better than in india let's say indonesia malaysia they're all much better than india but they don't have any science any universities there nothing you know so our government has to understand that this is actually one of our strengths and we should therefore build on it and turn it into capital but you know if you have uh, ministers who are uh, no interest in all these things we can't help it maybe things will change one can also try with state governments it can't need not only be with central government why karnataka which is a relatively affluent state why can't they support you know of course they have noble things like planetarium and so on yeah sorry i think everyone wants to go home so we were uh, all clear that's for the sake of funding the major dfp which we need to there maybe for the exhibition part that's what i felt that's what i felt talking on the same thing what you think uh, in the us and other developed countries we have also seen that their science is produced industry and it's let say uh, the creator of the phone who was a scientist he made something and from there he started a company and made a movie the basic science what you are saying is okay it's correct but in india we don't have that uh, what you can say the ecosystem there be uh, some industries like those that came up like belga which is a private enterprise so such thing has not came up in india even after 70 years of independence and what man state uh, the indian government is investing too much in science but we don't have something like pelda or something that's i think with one of the reasons that government is okay he means we have entrepreneurs on the basic science but not by not basic science, but other thing is like i do say it is like the biochemistry and the uh, chemistry lab they can have but even that has not produced any result in india we don't have industries like say pelda where they have to think about basic things Mm-hmm. No, no, so it's not like that. So we have to think about basic science and leave other things. And sir also said that particular thing was for uh, not for the few years of lag. Maybe the forum. Also. Even yeah. So, so my question was that they think that why we we lag there means our science people didn't set up such industries or didn't team up or as, as an enterprise. You know, we were a very poor country. You know, people like you who are very young, you don't know how poor India was. even i didn't know even i didn't know no 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 the overall level when i was a kid right uh, an old foggy so i can say even street lights and all couldn't be taken for granted even in cities even in hyderabad where i grew up you know there would be long stretches where there is no street light you know so it's it, it is today you are dazzled by for a mall and this mall and that hospital and so on it wasn't like this So, so I would say organic and chaotic and all put together. I don't know. May I see at least one grey hair at the back? So maybe he can, you know, corroborate what I'm saying. Do you think that what I'm saying is more or less right? No. So China was also the same shape as India. They also got independence at the same time we had, but they grew inorganic. It means like a socialist system and all. They try to put the students and put them in the. Uh, like what russia did that yeah you have to do this all i can say is young people like you have to get involved in the future of this country that's all i can say we can always have any any number of discussions on why things are this way or that way participate do your best that will be the way forward actually following up on this question about why did they they were not investing in rational energy that's to do with the fact that industry and the lake is partly yes and then there's no need for open competition and they also get and they also get all turnkey projects it's not like they want to develop anything you just get something from out, outside and just install it
So you want to ask him a question? Yeah. I like this. Thank you. My autograph. Nobody has asked me before for an autograph. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. reading even before you have read it because he has got it before you have. So this way with science is actually very difficult. An exponential rise in the amount of information in the type. He's democratic. It gives information to everybody, you know, especially yeah. the U.S. Yeah. Again, again, the government and other politicians that. Yeah. No, no, but it's a discourse. Yeah, lock in their own country. You can't claim to be a democracy and then say others should not talk for it. So it's just a space. You occupy it, you win it. You let others occupy it. Take care of it. What is it? Something they would have to not It won't remain the network for a very open thing. For very long, but for science, it would be quite remain. For politics, it might not remain. Thank you. After the talk, not mm. before. <laughs> <laughs> So basic degree, so you can, there's so many institutes where you can appear for interviews. Now it's very, thank you, you have right. but only thing is you have to set for parents.